أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا ونبينا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma ij'al ma naquluhu wa naf'aluhu khalisan li wajhika al-kareem. Tonight, insha'Allah, we'll be starting with the first lesson of the series. Did I get that right? Series. Because yesterday, my brothers Musa and Ayman told me that you said serious. I'll tell you why I said serious. Because in German, the word serious is pronounced Serie. So what I basically did was pronounce the S and the R in a different way. So Serie, Serie, Serious. Anyway, who else paid attention to, to me saying serious and recognized that I said it wrong? Raise your hand. Please raise your hand. It's okay. One, two, three, five. Keep your hands up. How many of you speak three languages fluently? Uh-huh. Fellas, there you go. I'm just kidding. One of our teachers, as he was teaching and uh, like giving the lesson when he would say something wrong or not like the way he should say it one of the students corrected him so he told him that it's okay since so uh, mistakes in pronouncing words or saying things that you shouldn't say will be corrected by your brain automatically so as long as you all understand what I'm trying to say, that's like the goal and that's the main thing. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Before I start with the first lesson, I'm just going to do a small and short recap of what we talked about yesterday. So yesterday we mentioned that in order to understand the world today, we have to look back at history because it's all tied together, it's all entangled. So in order to have a good understanding of current events, we have to look back at history. I also mentioned that history is a great teacher for future generations because then if we look at historical events and learn from them, we prevent ourselves from doing the same mistakes because history repeats itself in different shapes and different types, but it repeats itself. So if we take the needed lesson from history, we won't do the same mistakes like those before us. And then finally, I said that Ashura is one of the greatest historical events that we can benefit from and take the needed lessons from. And that's what we will, we will be doing, inshallah, starting tonight. If you are ready, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Tonight's topic, or the first lesson, is the lesson of the duty, at taklif Each and every one of us tries to find his purpose in life. What's my taklif? Why am I living? Why do I exist? 
What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want from me? Even if you're not a Muslim, you still ask yourself this question. Even if you don't believe in God, if, if you have some wisdom, you should ask yourself, where did I come from? Where am I going? Where's my destination? What's needed from me in this world? Why am I living? And why do we do what we do? If I was to ask one of you, why are you living? What's your purpose? What, what will your life look like in a few years? Because most of us, we just go to school. And then when we're done with school, we, we want to go to high school or university, get a degree. That's like a main goal in life. Okay, but what after that? You get a degree and then what? You go work? Tayyib, you worked, you earned money, and then what? You want to get married? Tayyib, next step. You have children? Tayyib, what's your next goal? You want to travel, see the world? Tayyib, okay, and after that what? Usually I don't get an answer. Everyone just like thinks, okay, what? So what's my purpose? Why am I living? What, what are my goals? What do I have to reach? Because we don't think about the future. We just think in the now. I want to finish. I want to get my degree. I want to get married, have kids. Okay, and after that, shoo. What's your next goal? This in general, if we want to take it a step further, come in for you to, to think and reflect, why do we do what we do on a daily basis? Every day we take decisions. If you're hungry, you want to eat. You have different options and then you pick one. Why did you pick this type of food? When you wake up in the morning, you, wanna, you look at your closet, you have many options. But why did you pick this dress today? Why did you pick this hoodie today? Why do you choose what you choose? Why do you do that? Based on what? Based on knowledge? Based on something else? Because animals, they don't have knowledge in, in this sense. But they still take decisions. But based on what? Instincts? If, if I was to ask some of you, like, why do you go to school? Why would you go to school? To, to gain knowledge. For what? What is knowledge good for? Why do you want to gain knowledge? Because I asked a few, they said we want to go to school because we want to gain knowledge so we can get a degree to earn money. But let's say you have money, why do you go to school? Because it's ab if you don't go to school? Are you ashamed that people will tell you, ah, oh, he didn't go to school, so that's why you go to school? Why do you want knowledge? Why do you choose what you choose every day? Based on what? What are you looking for? We are searching for something. Because we pick things based on what we see as complete, as Kamal. So if I see Kamal and completeness in something, I pick it. If I don't see Kamal in it, I won't pick it. But this is a different topic. I'm going to let you reflect on this point so that you can find your own answer. Like, why do I pick what I pick? Why do I choose what I choose every day? Based on what? Because we are looking for something, something, we are searching for something. But this is not the main topic today. I just wanted to, to say that because it has to do with our taklif and duty. Because why am I living? What am I supposed to do? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Wa ali Muhammad. So finding your taklif as a Muslim is one of the greatest achievements that you could reach or get to know your taklif, regardless of what it is. If your taklif is it to clean the bathrooms, then do it. Alhamdulillah, you, find, you found your taklif. If your taklif is it to be a scholar, then go be a scholar. Then you're doing your taklif. You're doing what you're supposed to do. 
if your taklif is to be a good housewife, then just be a good housewife. That's your taklif, alhamdulillah, you're fulfilling it. Regardless of what it is, because some think that in order to be a good Muslim, I need to go to Hawza, I need to study Islamic studies. If I don't do that, then I won't be a good believer. But that's not true. We can't all be scholars. We need this diversity. Because belief and Iman and Taqwa are not attached to Hawza. If you want to go to Hawza and study Islamic studies, you have to have higher aims than just being a believer. You can be a believer while doing what you're doing already. You don't have to leave everything to go to Hawza to become a good Muslim and a good believer. So we need this diversity in our society. We need to have doctors and uh, nurses and Abu Ayun, what is he called? Optician? Because you call him Abu Ayun, that's why I wanted to say Abu Ayun. So we need to have this diversity. We need bin mans, we need cashiers, we need everything. Look, a plane has one motor. Did I pronounce it right? Motor, just one. It has one cockpit. It has two, maybe four, eight, 16 wheels. Depends on the airplane. It has 80 windows, 100 windows, 200 windows, and thousands of screws and bolts. But for this plane to be a complete plane, to be a safe plane, it needs all of its parts. If one bolt is missing, one screw is missing, even if it's that small, the plane won't be complete. It won't be safe. So same thing with us as a society. We need, we can't all be muterat. We can't all be a cockpits. We can't all be windows. We need everything in our society in order to be a complete and whole society. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal made us shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. That's why we have this variety in our society. Because we need all stages and all levels to be complete. And um, so that's why if each and every one of us finds his taklif and his purpose and fulfills it, then he's doing the job that he has to do, that he needs to do. Because even animals have a duty, let's say. You know, like cows, for example. Allah Azza wa Jal created them for a purpose. Their perfection, their kamal, is it to be slaughtered and eaten by us. Allah Azza wa Jal created them as a benefit for the human being. So this animal reaches its kamal, its perfection, when we kill it and eat it. That's what it was made for. Hallah, usual vegetarians, no, we need to like, be good with the animals and everything. But Allah Azza wa Jal created these animals for us to eat them. And if He didn't create the cow for us, He would have created a different animal for us to eat. Do you understand my point that I'm trying to say? These animals were specifically created for us as food. That's our worldview, that's how we see it. Tayyib. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So once you know your taklif, or let's say the relieving part about knowing your taklif and your duty is that you only have to do it and act accordingly. You don't have to worry about the results. You just do what you have to do. The result is in Allah's hands. And for example, Nabi Musa had to flee from Fir'aun. He did that. Allah Azza wa took care of the rest. And Nabi Ibrahim السلام, saw in his dream that he was slaughtering Ismail السلام, And he was going to do what he was ordered to do. That's his taklif. Allah Azza wa Jal, he then stepped in and took care of the rest. But as long as you are doing what you have to do, as long as you find your taklif and act accordingly, that's all you have to worry about. The results are then in Allah's hands.
طيب so in each era and stage we find that Muslims had this issue they had this problem of not recognizing their duty the real taklif that they had that they have to act upon Imam al Hussein alayhi salam recognized his duty very well unlike the majority of the Muslim Ummah he knew that at that time there was nothing more important than standing up against Yazid than revolting against Yazid and he tried to tell the people around him that this is our taklif this is our duty but those around him didn't listen to him they were looking for secondary tasks for secondary taklifs they didn't recognize the primary taklif which is to revolt against Imam al Hussein. tomorrow inshallah I will be talking about patience and I'll be going into detail in, in this point we'll, we'll look at what they were telling Imam al Hussein. the majority of the Muslim Ummah was looking for secondary taklifs it's not that they were of Ahl dunya not all of them were from Ahl dunya and didn't want to go with Imam al Hussein. some of them maybe thought I'll just say in, in Mecca and in Medina I'll take care of the Shia here of the Muslims here I don't have to go with Imam al Hussein. But Imam al-Hussein salam recognized his taklif and wanted to act accordingly. And he told those, the, the people around him, that this is our taklif, this is our duty. And I said that we don't have to worry about the results as long as we're just doing what we have to do. Imam al-Hussein, his taklif was to go and save Islam. Imam al Hussein stood up to save Islam. His intention wasn't to overthrow Yazid and be in control and in charge of the Muslim Ummah and community. That wasn't his goal. Neither was his goal to go and reach martyrdom. If you ask Imam al Hussein, why are you going to Karbala? Why are you heading to Iraq? He's not going to tell you because I want to reach martyrdom. He knew that he was going to reach martyrdom, but he wasn't going to reach martyrdom. That wasn't his intention. If you ask him, why are you revolting against Yazid? He's not going to tell you because I want to be the head of the Muslim Ummah. I want to be the leader of the Muslim Ummah. He went because he wanted to save Islam. That's it. Yani Allah Azza wa Jal could have opened for Imam al Hussein a different door. And not, can, uh, maybe he would have prevented him from reaching Karbala and did something else to him. Yani for example, Nabi Ibrahim and Nabi Ismail, I mentioned Ablishway. Uh, my tongue is uh, uh, affected by the Lebanese lecture of Lishway, like a few uh, hours ago. Uh, Nabi Ibrahim and Nabi Ismail, if we ask Nabi Ibrahim, why did you put the knife on the neck of Ismail alayhi salam? He's not going to tell you because I want to slaughter my son Ismail. I'm putting the knife on his neck because that's what I have to do. Then Allah Azza stepped in and he told him, خلص, don't do it anymore. صدقت الرؤية خلاص the test is done يعني is it impossible let's say we want to do uh, a فرضية what do you how do you say فرضية no فرضية let's let's say يعني just Imam al Hussein عليه السلام Allah عز وجل would have opened a different door for him not to die in Karbala then like anything else would have took place for example just like how uh, Nabi Ibrahim عليه السلام didn't slaughter Ismail at the end Let's say Imam Allah Azza wa opened a different door for Imam al-Hussein not to die in Karbala. So Imam al-Hussein, the point that the main point that I'm trying to say, Imam al-Hussein wasn't going to die in Karbala. That wasn't his goal. His goal was just to do his taklif. That's it. Not more than that and not less than that. Another example which makes it more clear in terms of the Muslim society and the Muslim Ummah, if we look at the time of Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam, you all know that Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam was in prison for around 15 years. طيب, where were the Shia at that time? Did it, Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam have followers and supporters? Where were they? 
their primary task should have been to free the Imam of their time, the Hussein of their time. What were they doing instead? Going to Karbala, visiting Imam al Hussein. But their primary task should have been to free your Hussein that is in prison, not go and visit Imam al Hussein and Karbala. Do the primary task that is needed from you. And we can ask ourselves this question in our time. What is my primary task in this time? What am I doing for Imam al-Mahdi Sharif in this time? What is needed from me? Halla. Al-an. Now. Jetzt. Say it in German too. So what is needed from me now? What am I doing for the Imam of my time? Let's say Imam Mahdi reappears tomorrow. And he comes to each and every one of us and asks us, Habibi, what did you do for me? What did you do to hasten my reappearance? Do we have an answer? Or are we going to tell him, Wallah, I was busy, uh, you know, working and doing this and that. So, just like how the people in the time of Imam al-Kadhim didn't recognize their primary duty to free the Imam of their time and they were visiting Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam we should recognize our primary duty here I want to talk about the difference between al-ibadah and al-ubudiyya al-ibadah is the worship types of worship salah, sawm, khums, zakat these are all ibadah al ubudiya is obedience or servanthood. There's a difference between ibadah and ubudiya. Some people love ibadah, but this is not what we want. We don't want to love ibadah. We want to have ubudiya because ibadah is the path and the way to ubudiya. For example, let's say we have on a Friday Salat al Jumu'ah and we would like to attend to Salat al Jumu'ah. But at the same time, my mother, my wife, my daughter, my father, anyone in the house needs me. They are sick or they need me, they need my help, they need my support. Whatever it is, we just tell Allah when I say that they need me. If I am a lover of ibadah, I will tell them, no, I want to go pray. But if I'm a lover or looking for ubudiyah, then I will stay at home and help them and be there for them. What is needed is ubudiyah, not ibadah. Another example is and this this example they mention in jurisprudence always they say if somebody was drowning in the sea or in the river and there's only two minutes left for salah that's how the example is like one one by one and one to one and there's only two minutes left for salah what would you do pray or go rescue him if you don't pray, it's going to be other. If you are looking for ibadah and loving ibadah because you love ibadah for ibadah, then you're going to go pray. But you can't do that. Then you're doing haram if you pray in this case. Yani. But if you are looking for ubudiyah and obedience and servanthood, you're going to leave prayer aside and go rescue him. A better example that you all can relate to maybe is we have all like our grandfathers and the, the, the elder in our generation when the doctor tells them you can't fast during Shahar Ramadan it will harm you and they still insist on fasting and no, no I have to fast how like, I want to fast in Shahar Ramadan but the doctor tells them it's, it's going to harm you if you fast in Shahar Ramadan and they still insist on fasting on Shahar Ramadan they are looking for ibadah, they love ibadah for ibadah but Allah Azza wa is telling them you, you're not allowed to fast it's gonna harm you you can't do anything to harm yourself 
So if they have ubudiyah, they will not fast. طيب. So the point that I want to say and clarify here is that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was looking for ubudiyah. He knew that Allah Azza wa Jal wanted him to go and revolt. He didn't want him to stay in Medina and teach Islam and be in Mecca in a safe place. Allah Azza wa Jal wanted him to go and stand up against Yazid. And that's what he did. And that should have uh, done the community or the Muslim Ummah in the time of Imam Al-Kadhim salam. They should have went to free their Imam in order to have obedience. Ta'a lillah Azza wa Jal. Not go and do ziyara and do hajj and whatsoever. <coughs> so, so far, Imam al Hussein salam was practicing abudiyya, servanthood. He was a abid lillah Azza wa Jal. And the rank of abudiyya, the rank of the abid, is the highest rank a Muslim can reach. Because in tashahud we say, وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ we say, and I witness that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger. The scholars say that the servanthood was before the messenger because it has more importance. So our goal in life is to become, is to become a servant of Allah Azza wa Jal. That you do what Allah asks, asks, asks you to do, what is requested from you. That you recognize your duty and act accordingly. One of the scholars that I really like, Sheikh Habib al Kazimi, in one of his lectures, he mentioned something that I want to share with you. Maybe we'll call it, we'll do a challenge, yani. Good challenge, yani, a beneficial challenge, inshallah. He says, How many of us can reflect for one minute on the fact of. Uh, or let's say, how many of us can reflect for only one minute that they are a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He tells his audience and requests from them to sit and reflect for one minute upon the fact that they are servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just for one minute without letting your mind wander left and right. Just to be focused for one minute and to realize that you are a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I tried it myself, it was very hard, so I'm just going to leave it to you. Try it and let me know your results and give me feedback on how it was. Because you'll see how, how weak we are since we can't even control our thoughts. طيب, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So knowing your duty is hard enough. But once you know your duty, it's even harder to act upon your duty. And there's one more thing that's very important too. Once you know your duty and act accordingly, you have to do so in time. Because sometimes if you, then, if you don't act upon your duty in time, it won't leave the needed effect. Yani if we have a patient who is sick and needs medication, if we don't give him the needed medication in time, even if we give it to him after a while in a higher dose, it won't leave the needed effect on him because he needs this medicine in this specific time. If we run late, it's not going to leave the needed impact and effect on him. And that's the main difference between at tawabin and the companions of Imam al-Hussein. At-Tawwabin, the remorse seekers. At-Tawwabin died for Imam al-Hussein. And the companions of Imam al-Hussein also died for Imam al-Hussein. They both died for Imam al-Hussein. The difference is that At-Tawwabin didn't, yani they recognized their taklif late, not in time, and then they acted according their taklif also late, not in time. 
And that's the biggest difference between them and the companions. And if the companions have their rank because they fulfilled their task in the needed time. The Tawabin don't have the same rank because they run late. So that's why once we recognize our taklif, we have to act accordingly and in time. I want to finish with two things, two short points. The first one is that one of our scholars mentions that there is no doubt that some of the companions of Imam al Hussein aborted their very first and obligate Hajj to go with Imam al Hussein to Karbala. And here we see the difference between Ibadah and Ubudiyya. It's Hajj. They aborted Hajj to go with Imam al Hussein because they saw that this was their, their duty and their taklif. If they were lovers of Ibadah, they would have said, I'll just finish my Hajj and then set out with you, set off with you. They aborted their Hajj and went with the Imam of their time. Allah, if you ask, how can I recognize my taklif? How can I know what my taklif is? I don't know how you can recognize your taklif. But I can give you something that may help you recognize your taklif. Sheikh Habib al Kazimi, in an interview on Sheikh Bahjat, Qaddasallahu Nafsahu, narrates a story. He says, When I visited Sheikh Bahjat one time, after I was done with my Hausa studies, I asked him a question. I asked him, how do I know what my duty is? How can I find out my taklif? I'm almost done with my studies and I don't know what to do. Should I stay in Hawza and teach? Should I write books? Should I give lectures? Should I travel? Should I stay? I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So how can I find out what I'm supposed to do? Sheikh Bahjad gives him an answer. Sheikh Bahjad told him, أكثر من الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد تفتح لك الطريق اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد He told him recite salawat many times with the intention of to find out your taklif and Allah عز وجل will show you the path will show you your taklif صلوا على محمد وآل محمد I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us hearts and minds that recognize their taklif in time and act accordingly. The verse says, فَخَرَجَ مِنْهَا خَائِفًا يتركب. One of the hardest moments on Imam al Hussein was it to leave al Medina, his beloved Medina, the city of his grandfather. Before he left the Medina, he went to the grave of the Prophet to bid farewell to him. He went to the grave of Sayyidah Fatima to bid farewell to her. Imam al Hussein was the last one of Ahl al Kisa. And in order to save Islam, he had to leave al Medina. The poet says on behalf of Imam al Hussein at the grave of Rasulullah the following Ma khid ana kil ikhwiti. I'm taking with me all my siblings. Abbas hamil rayiti. Abbas is my flag holder. Atlub min Allah nusrati. I request from Allah victory. Rayih ya Jaddil Karbala. I'm setting out to Karbala, O oh grandfather. 